Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for your grace. We thank you for the mercy that is borne out in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who paid the penalty, who paid the price for our iniquity, that we might be forgiven. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the Holy Spirit who will abide with us, who will comfort us in difficult times, who will guide us along difficult paths, who will teach us that which we should know. And Father God, we thank you for the benefit of having each other as we pray for each other. Even if we cannot be together, we uphold each other and we ask you to strengthen each and every one of us. So, Father God, as we watch this video, may we do so with the joy of knowing that you care for us, that you provide for us, and you watch over us. Father, we ask this in the name of our Almighty God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. Amen. Psalm 24, verses 3 to 10. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen.
1 Kings 11, verses 1 to 12. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, You must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had seven hundred wives of royal birth and three hundred concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. This is the word of the Lord. Over the past little while, in my own personal study, and my own personal investigation of, of what's going on in the church, what's going on in the world, I've become more and more aware of what is now being called progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity is the idea that, that believers will progress beyond the gospel. They will progress beyond what God has revealed to us in scripture, and they will discover a, a new kind of faith. Really what they are discovering is what Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, once called a feather bed, by which he meant that it is a feather bed they can use to break their fall as they are traveling away from the Christian faith. Half-hearted faith, half-hearted loyalty has always been a problem for the church. Christians who have a half-hearted loyalty have a divided loyalty. Half of their heart is in the kingdom, but the other half of their heart is consumed with the cares of this world. And Jesus talks about when the word of the gospel falls upon the rocky places, falls amongst the thorns, that the cares of this world will choke out the gospel message in the half-hearted believer. There are many examples of half-hearted faith half-hearted loyalty in the scripture but we've read from the book of first kings chapter 11 how solomon had a half-hearted loyalty to god and we see that half-heartedness in how it played out in his own marital life solomon would end up having 700 wives and 300 concubines an absolutely ridiculous number but why did he do such a thing? Why did he he practice polygamy to, to such a ridiculous level? It is because he had a half-hearted loyalty to God. By the end of his life, Solomon would write in the book of Ecclesiastes, Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Life is vanity meaningless. He had spent his life in the pursuit of knowledge. He spent his life in the pursuit of, of wealth. He spent his life in the pursuit of pleasure. And it all came up as meaningless to him. 
He had spent his life in a half-hearted loyalty to God, and it accounted or amounted to nothing. Everything that he gained, he was going to lose. He had no promise that everything he left for posterity was not going to be wasted away. He looked at his life as having been worthless. But why was it worthless? Why did he come to that conclusion? When we look at the life of Solomon, we see a man who has been gifted with wealth, with power, with privilege unprecedented in his time. He was given a kingdom at peace. His borders were secure. He was given wealth beyond imagining. When you, when you read the account of, of how much wealth Solomon had, it was ridiculous. So many tons of gold flowed into the capital city in Jerusalem every year. That silver was considered a base metal. Silver was considered to be little more than the stones upon which uh, people walked. 25 tons of, of gold flowed into the capital each year just from one source. He had other sources of wealth. He was wealthy beyond imagining. He was the wisest of the men of his age. His nation was secure. It was an empire. But that wasn't good enough for Solomon. At that, In those ancient times, Solomon followed the path of the other kings. See, one of the things that ancient kings used to do was to, to, to shore up, to secure their borders. They would marry daughters or marry women from other royal families, from no, noble families from around the region. And so Solomon, following in this ancient tradition, married the daughter of Pharaoh, and he married a total of about 700 wives, a ridiculous number. A ridiculous number of wives for this man, all in the, the pursuit of, of securing his borders, making sure his kingdom would last, his kingdom would be secure. Solomon was not a warrior king like his father David. Solomon was, a, was more of a pacifist. He stayed home, he, he lived in his luxury, he pursued knowledge, he pursued science, he was uh, wise beyond all others of his age in almost every respect. But in one respect, Solomon failed big time. In one respect, his wisdom failed him completely. When God had come to Solomon at the beginning of his reign, he said, if you follow my commandments, if you keep the law that I have given you, I will protect your nation. But Solomon didn't trust God completely. Solomon wasn't sold out to God completely. He trusted in the treaties that he made by marrying all these these women, by marrying the daughter of the Pharaoh, by marrying women from Moab and Ammon and, and, and from Sidon. And the end result was Solomon was led astray by his own wives. In being led astray by his own wives, Solomon sowed the destruction for the nation of Israel. It wouldn't happen in his lifetime, but he was sowing a harvest of destruction by disobeying God, by having divided loyalty, by, by loving all of his foreign wives. He wanted to care for them. He wanted them to, to believe that in the land of Israel, in the, in the city of Jerusalem, they could feel at home. So he built altars for their gods. And three are named specifically. There was an altar built for the goddess of Asherah. There was an altar built for uh, Chemosh. There was an altar built for Molech. Each one of these foreign gods, Asherah of the Sidonians, Molech of the uh, Ammonites, Chemosh of the Moabites, these foreign gods required in their religious systems practices which were 
to God an abomination. Asherah of the Sidonians, the goddess of the Sidonians, in her worship, the worship of the idol, gathered around the tree or in their temple or whatever it was that they would worship this goddess, there were prostitutes who were slaves of the religious system. They were sold into prostitution they, uh, or they were born into prostitution as slaves at the temple. They knew no other life. And so the worshippers who would come and worship Asherah would, would get drunk and hire to themselves a, a prostitute, maybe a young girl or, or whatever. But to God this was an abomination. In the worship of Moloch, the god of the Ammonites, there was the sacrifice of infants. The, the, the altar, the idol of, of Moloch would have his hands outstretched and they would heat the, the idol up and they would place their infant children upon the altar and, and to keep the parents from hearing the screams of their children as they were dying, being roasted alive, they would have musicians plague this was and is an abomination to god the other god chemosh of the moabites he was not a discriminating god he would accept human sacrifice of any age and so these three gods of the the neighbors of of the nation of israel are mentioned specifically each one is an abomination to the god of israel who does not want prostitution, who does not want the murder of infants or even the murder of unborn children, who does not want human sacrifice of any kind. Each one of these altars was set up by Solomon. Why? To make his wives happy. He loved his wives. He wanted them to be happy, to engage in religious practices that made them comfortable to engage in religious practices that was meaningful to them, but an abomination to the God of Israel. Solomon had a divided heart. Yes, he called himself a, a follower of the God of Israel, but in the end he was bowing down to these false gods. In the end he was worshipping not just the God of heaven, but these made-up gods whose human followers had created such awful rituals and justified it in the name of religion. By trying to keep the peace at home, Solomon brought destruction upon the land of Israel. God came to, to Solomon and told him the consequences of his actions. God was going to take the land of Israel and wrest it from the family of Solomon. Yet, for the sake of King David, one of the tribes would be left, the tribe of, of Judah. Now, as you look a little bit further ahead, when Jeroboam leads the rebellion against Solomon's son, Rehoboam, Solomon actually keeps, or Solomon's family, David's family, actually keeps three tribes, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Simeon. Now, has God, has God got it wrong? Has Scripture got it wrong that, that God said there would be one tribe to remain, but actually three did? Well, not really, because by this time, the tribe of Simeon had ceased to exist as a, a political unit. Simeon had been swallowed up and had become part of Judah. So when we talk about Judah today, it's actually two tribes, Judah and Simeon. And virtually the same thing can be said about the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of the tribes. So tiny that, and it was right there next to Jerusalem that even though it might have wanted to rebel away, it remained a part of Judah. And after this time period, Benjamin really ceases to exist as a tribe. So what ends up is the tribe of Judah absorbs Benjamin. It has already absorbed Simeon, and it just becomes Judah. These three tribes essentially become one tribe. That's all that's left. All the other tribes, Manasseh, Ephraim, Dan, Issachar, the list goes on, they rebelled. They became the northern kingdom of Israel under a new king, Jeroboam. This all happened because of Solomon's sin. Solomon's half-hearted loyalty to God, worshipping the God of Israel and other 
gods. And Solomon, for all his wisdom, behaved in a very foolish manner. Solomon, despite all of his wealth, behaved like a man who was poor, desperate to follow whoever would give him an advantage. Solomon, for all the security that God had given to him, acted insecure acted like he was under constant threat, married 700 wives to secure his borders, and ended up bringing about destruction to the nation of Israel. It's a great story. What's that got to do with us? Well, we could look at our, our bigger political situation going on, and we can see people who have rejected loyalty to the God of Israel and are busy destroying the nation that God has given to them. But what about the believer today? We also face pressure from society. Some of us face pressure from family. Some of us face pressure about our jobs to conform to this world, to have a half-hearted loyalty to the God of Israel. And this pressure has been around a long time. Just bend the knee to the God of this age. Just bend the knee to the God of secular humanism. Just bend the knee to the God of Marxism. Just bend the knee to the God of, of identity politics. And we'll let you live in peace. It's not true, of course. But that's the lie that's, we're, that's being offered up to the Christians. Just give us a little more. We won't ask for more than that. And we know from experience over watching society over these past decades, every time the church gives a little bit, the world says, great, now give us more. Every time the church gives in on an issue, the world comes in and demands more until, until we're made to, to face a choice to reject Jesus altogether or to face persecution from a society that was theoretically founded by people who love the God of Israel. People who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're now living in an atheistic, God-hating society. But there's more. There's more. Many believers, many people face uh, from their own families, pressure to compromise their loyalty to God. Many believers face a, a push to give up that which God has asked of them. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Are we keeping his commandments? Or are we conforming our lives to the God of this age? the God of this world, or are we standing firm with Jesus? Those really are challenges for the church. I think of my late uncle who made a statement one time, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. He, he made the observation that you know the, many of his friends, many of his uh, compatriots stood for moral integrity, stood for for a Judeo-Christian understanding of morality until the day their, one of their children came home and said, Dad, I'm living an alternate lifestyle. Until one of their kids came home and said, Mom, I'm not living the way the Bible says I should be living. I'm living the way the world says I should live. And the people of this, of this world, of that generation, could not abandon their morality fast enough because it was a morality that was grounded in tradition. But not a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a morality grounded in something which they no longer believed in. And when push came to shove and they realized they no longer had or they never had a relationship with the creator of the universe. They never had a relationship with Jesus. They couldn't shed that morality fast enough. So for the love of their children, they rejected the law of God. They had no relationship with the lawgiver. So what did they want with the law anyway? For Solomon, 
there was no excuse. God had, had promised him wisdom and riches and protection. But did he trust God for protection? He received the wisdom, he received the riches, but the protection that was from God, he decided to take that upon himself. He married all of those wives to protect the land, only bringing destruction. Solomon, the wisest man besides Jesus Christ to have ever lived, really blew it. He's, his divided loyalty brought destruction. And there are many in the church today who are following Solomon's example. There are many people who call themselves believers in Jesus who are practicing divided loyalty. Now, that's a harsh way to put it. But when we are faced with the situation, do we stand with our, our, our family members? Do we stand with our children who might be living a lifestyle that God calls an abomination? Do we compromise our faith? When we are faced with, with family members who are doing things which are in direct violations of the commands of Jesus, and yes, Jesus gave us lots of commands, do we say it's okay, Jesus didn't mean it? Do we divide our loyalty? We'll, we'll stay loyal to God in some areas, but we'll show our loyalty to the God of this age by, by being affirming and supporting of family members who have rejected the truth of Jesus Christ. Well, they might still call themselves a Christian. I'm born again, but there's, no, there's nothing in the Bible that says living together is wrong. I'm born again, but there's nothing in the Bible that says abortion is wrong. I'm born again, but there's nothing, nothing in the Bible that says homosexuality is wrong. Are we compromising? Do we compromise our loyalty to Jesus? Do we have a half-hearted loyalty? This is really hard. This is really hard because we are constantly receiving pressure from our society. We are constantly receiving pressure from the media, from the government, from maybe from our jobs. We are constantly receiving pressure from our families to surrender those things which God has asked us to hold on to. I've been watching this progressive Christianity. They cannot shed Christian morals fast enough. They cannot reject the word of God fast enough. They cannot abandon Jesus fast enough. Oh, they still have a Jesus, a Jesus that they have created in their imaginations, a Jesus who bears nothing to the real Jesus. He has no commonality with the living God. They still say they worship Jesus. But when we look at the evidence, who are they worshiping? The, ev the evidence is they're worshiping the God of this age. We are called to live holy lives. We're called to follow the commands of Christ. We are called to be obedient to our Lord, our Savior, our Creator. We are called not to have divided loyalties. What's the solution? Can we find our own feather bed to, to lessen the blow as we, we turn our loyalties back to Jesus? No, not really. Following Jesus requires making hard decisions. They're clear cut, but they're hard. Listen to what Jesus said in the, the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. Let me read this to you. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and child, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Did you hear that? This is Jesus speaking. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and child, 
brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What does he mean by that? Are we supposed to literally hate our family members? No, that's not quite what he's saying. What he's saying is that in comparison to our love to Jesus, what we have for our family members can be mistaken for, can be seen as hate. Yes, we love them. In fact, if we love Jesus Christ with our whole heart, we will love our family members more. But compared to our love for Jesus, it will seem like hate because we will declare with Joshua that we will serve the Lord. That we declare with our own hearts that if our family calls us to compromise our faith, we won't. We love them, but we're not going to compromise our faith. We care for them, but we're not going to walk away from Jesus. We, we want the best for them, and we understand that it is Jesus Christ who is the best for them. Making them feel good while they go off into sin, that's not the best for them. Making our, our loved ones think that God doesn't care about what their sins are. Everybody goes to heaven. God is just this warm, gushy, uh, feel-good, fluffy, cloud kind of God. There's no righteousness in God. Making them feel that, that's sin. That's evil. To follow Jesus is to put him first. To follow Jesus is to put everything else secondary. Our families, our children, our parents. Jesus must be first in our lives. In a society that calls us to compromise our faith, to have divided loyalty, there must be no division in our hearts. Our hearts belong to Jesus. Full stop. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, the Lord of our hearts. Jesus, the Lord of our lives, has our full loyalty. We obey his commands. We serve him. If no one goes with us, we will still follow him. We are called not to have divided loyalty. We are called to serve the King of Kings. Oh, but what about in hard times? What about when the protesters come along and demand us to kneel down to their gods? Do we kneel down to their gods? No. We stand for Jesus. We might even have to die for Jesus. But Jesus is Lord. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody face it, posted on, on Facebook, and it really caught my eye. The problem the church sometimes feels is that we are asking people to choose between heaven and hell. We're not. We're asking people to choose between this earth and heaven. We're asking people to give up the pleasures of this life for a life eternal with God Almighty. That's a hard thing. And the world comes to us and says, give up heaven for this world. What are we going to do? Will we sacrifice our, our relationship with God to get along with the world? Will we sacrifice our relationship with God? Will we have divided loyalty to, to make our families feel better, to make our children feel good about themselves? Will we stand firm for Jesus Christ our Lord? Do we stand upon the holy rock? Do we look at God's love for us, our Savior's love for us, and realize that it is a treasure worth more even than our own lives? That is the challenge for the church. It's the challenge for the church, the same challenge we've had for 2,000 years. Will we follow Jesus with an undivided heart? Or will we walk compromised like Solomon? This is our challenge. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have died for our sins. We thank you that you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, in power and in glory, interceding on our behalf. 
Help us to keep our hearts loyal to you, not in part, but in whole. Help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the Savior of our souls. Lord God, do not let us be discouraged when we look at this world. We know that in this world we will have troubles. But we give thanks to you, for you have overcome the world. This morning, Lord God, may our hearts be ever grateful. May our loyalty be to you first and foremost. And through our loyalty to you, may we show the love of God, the reality of your love to our family, to our friends and our neighbors. Lord God, I ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts 
and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen.